the legend spreads from the Braveheart soundtrack, and this is probably the piece of music that, that hooked me for, for playing the Ellen Pipes. an Irish bagpipe, more properly called the Illan bagpipe. A uh, few people might have heard of this. It's spelled Yulian and is quite often pronounced that way, but it is actually pro properly pronounced Illan and it's the Gallic word for elbow. It is a form of bagpipe, very different from the Great Highland bagpipe that most people are familiar with. I am uh, sitting here wearing it and basically because it is an instrument that has to be played in a seated position. Um, the chanter has to be pressed on the leg throughout most of the scale, and you can't do that while you're standing up. It's all arms. Basically, I'm feeding the bag air with the bellows and then controlling the pressure that's going out the, in out the instrument with my left arm on the, on the bag itself. You basically, you're learning with a bellows and a bag and the chanter. As you progress to learning some tunes and having some, some, uh, some mastery of it, you add the next phase, which is what is on the table here, almost complete. Most of a set of Illan pipe drones. This long piece is the bass drone. The little tiny one is the tenor drone, and uh, I don't have pieces of the baritone drone here. They weren't far enough along to be, to be worth showing. They just look like pieces of wood still at this point. They've just been bored but they're twi it's, it's roughly twice the size of the tenor drone and looks pretty much the same. The uh, bass drone presents some challenges for the maker because it's the only bagpipe that I'm aware of that actually has bends in its length. Without these bends, this thing would be enormously long. It would be hitting the floor when you're actually, when you're actually playing it. And getting these little bends um, accomplishing them uh, was one of the ch big challenges of learning to make this instrument and it's basically a crossover making these little sections is a crossover into making brass instruments trumpets trombones french horns tubas that type of thing to bend it without having a kink in the bend is the challenge and I had to have a special tube bender made, as well as a rather unusual material called cerobend, which is actually, it's a combination lead, cadmium, and bismuth. Uh, most of the brass instrument makers use uh, this material or something similar. Extremely low melting point. The material is melted down into, into liquid form, poured into the brass tube, allowed to cool and harden, and then the tube is placed in the bender and uh, bent into shape. The bent piece is then heated up again and the lead mixture pours out and you have a bent piece of tubing. And uh, this section, this instrument has got two of them. Uh, at the very, very end here, this section, some Illin pipe makers have another similar type of bend here, but uh, the particular pattern that I'm following for making this, which is a, the Leo Rosum pattern from the uh, early part of the last century, um, instead of actually having a bend, they've got this little welded bridge across. But it's once again where the sound and the air passing through changes directions once again 180 degrees. And this little, what they call the resonator on the end, is where the sound actually exits the drone. It's quite a low-pitched drone. It's a real deep down growl. My initial diving into making bagpipes or, or anything to do with making bagpipes was actually making reeds for one of these. It draws on all different kinds of different disciplines. Uh, I've had to really, really get comfortable with metalworking to make this particular bagpipe. Uh, you don't ever put your mouth on any, on any part of this instrument. It's a dry reed instrument, bellows blown. One of these reeds, as such, can last a very long time, even decades. But uh, every maker, because they make things a little bit differently from the, from the next guy, not everybody's reed will work in everybody's chanter. And so if you're going to make this, you pretty much have to learn how to make reeds. And then this is the staple. This is the little tube that these blades are actually tied to inside. And uh, more metal work again. Uh, it starts off as a flat sheet of copper. That This is my little, my little stencil for actually cutting out the sheet at the beginning. And I don't know if you can see, there's a very gentle 
taper in this. And uh, the taper has to approximate the taper on the bore of the inside of the chanter. If you make the staple out of straight tubing, uh, your second octave is going to be likely out of tune. The taper actually keeps the, uh, the second octave in tune with the first. So you cut out a piece of copper to exactly this dimension. I scribe the pattern out onto the little sheet of copper and cut it out with aviation snips. And it always comes out a little proud of what I want it to be at the finished dimension. I file it down to the exact dimension. The little copper sheet is then wrapped around this little mandrel, which looks just basically like a stick, but it does have a precise little taper along its length. I wrap the, the copper around it and then, and then roll the copper until it completely wraps around it. And, and as you keep on rolling it and working it, the copper will actually close along the edge. And then once that's done, you have to crush that little eye shape. And uh, that's accomplished, first of all, by coming through the back with this, which, with this mandrel that has little flats on it. And it's just basically squeezed down with a pair of pliers. Um, and then the actual eye shape is refined with this one that comes in from the front. And it's either you know, squeezed, tapped, banged, uh, manipulated, however it needs to be until you achieve the proper shape. The joint has to be silver soldered in order to do this well. And uh, another thing, another metal working thing that I had to learn how to recently do. After you've got the staple made, um, the cane blades are forged out of cane tubes, which are gouged down to a, partic to a particular thickness and uh, formed into the proper shape. And then they are uh, tied onto the, onto the staple. And then is shaved down and, and uh, manipulated to a specific thickness along the length of the blades down to the tips. And then you can start testing the reed and making adjustments where you need to. It's a rare instrument. The handful of people who make it well have got a, uh, a pretty long waiting list for their product. Um, I'm hoping to, to join that rank. You know, I've been, it's, it's been <laughs> almost like a college program learning how to make this instrument. And, and to make everything properly and make it and make it well. The full instrument, which has got parts to it that we haven't even talked about yet, uh, is just about a month's work to make one if you're making it with the traditional methods. My dad was a retired journeyman machinist and uh, we started discussing the possibility that if I had gotten a hold of plans or measurements of some sort for drones for the Irish pipes that uh, perhaps we could actually make them because the uh, because makers were so obscure at this point and uh, it just slowly kind of started to get me interested into the manufacturing process of making bagpipes so even though I at that point I had been playing Great Highland bagpipes for 30 plus years it was the interest in the Irish pipes and the problems that go along with them <laughs> that actually got me interested in making pipes. I play with a couple of good friends of mine, uh, Stu McLeod and Mark DuBorg. Basically Celtic tunes. Uh, I'm playing the Ellen pipes, uh, Mark DeBorg plays mandolin or banjo, sometimes guitar, and Stu is playing the boron, the little uh, Celtic hand drum. And uh, it's nice, we, we play acoustically, basically because this particular bagpipe is quiet enough that it doesn't drown out everything else in the room. When you play a great Highland bagpipe with other instruments, usually all the other instruments have to be put on microphones uh, while the bagpipe stays acoustic <laughs> so that everything can be heard. Um, but here the, vol the volumes balance out quite well and it's also its concert pitch. The Illin pipes can play tunes in uh, many different keys. It's the only bagpipe that can actually achieve a second octave. My chanter has got four keys on it. This instrument is in the key of D. You can actually play any black and white key on the piano keyboard within two octaves of D. 
a lot of people are looking at this and thinking, geez, I've never even heard of that. Yet the funny thing is, it's in all likelihood you have very much heard the bagpipe, heard this particular kind of bagpipe. The soundtrack to Braveheart, because of the fact that it was, uh, that it's a more um, diverse instrument for being, and capable instrument for being played with, uh, with orchestral instruments, the Illin pipes were used all the way through the soundtrack, not the actual traditional Scottish Great Highland bagpipe. Um, there's another one, another very, very well-known soundtrack that the Illin pipes featured, and people probably didn't even know that they were hearing a bagpipe. Opening to the soundtrack of Titanic. <laughs>